All right, good morning, everyone. I think this is where we were last week, uh, talking about in the dialogue, uh, Galileo is trying to make the, the point that whether the earth was moving or not, everything that we experience here on earth would not change. Fundamentally because of the law of inertia. There were really, in his mind, there were two versions of inertia. One, the correct one, for linear motion, moving in a straight line at a constant speed. You cannot tell whether you are in that kind of a state or you are standing still. Okay? And the obvious example is moving in a plane, moving at six, 700 miles an hour. And we have, except for the vibration of the plane, we have no notion that we are moving. We can easily war, pour our water into the glass and the water goes straight down into the glass, even though we're moving along with respect to the uh, surface of the earth at six, 700 miles an hour. That is the law of inertia. Galileo had a, a second idea of inertia that if you're moving in a large circle, that is also in a sense, a natural motion. And everything that is moving in that circle would continue to move in that circle forever. It's very interesting, this is not true. Uh, Galileo is still stuck in that mindset of the natural motion of circular motion. Such a powerful idea that dominated uh, thinking for uh, you know, 2000 years, he was not able to break free of that. Um, uh, he still thought the motion of, of being on the surface of the earth, the earth being large enough, and certainly the earth going around the sun, even a much, much larger circle with large circles like that, uh, the natural motion of the circle would dominate and therefore things would continue to move. That's why the clouds stay with us and the birds can fly in the air and, and land on, on, uh, on branches, no trouble. That's why we can drop things from towers and they fall down from the bottom of the tower because of his notion of circular emotion, he, he, inertia. He does, of course, realize that these things are moving in circles because of the nature of natural circular motion. The example that he gives, he goes, he gives to the right example of linear inertia, where he has the uh, ship, the moving ship at a constant speed, being the analogy of the earth and dropping the ball from the mass where it will fall down to the bottom of the mass. That's the correct explanation. He extends that to the circular motion that we, we are experiencing on the earth because of the rotating and the revolving, and he makes the same argument, okay? That's incorrect. The reason why we can move in these circles and not uh, feel the effects is because the circles that we're moving in are so large uh, that the, uh, for any small amount of time, the actual way in which we're traveling is virtually in a straight line. Certainly we can see it uh, most easily with going around the sun. Uh, if you were to look at any small piece of the orbit of the Earth, it is virtually a straight line. Even the Earth is large enough. When we look out <clears throat> on a lake, a large, large lake, it looks perfectly flat. It's not, it's curved, but because the curve is so gentle, because the Earth is so big, to us, the water surface looks perfectly flat. That's why the inertia argument, uh, you know, it can work for, for the large circular motion. And so, We'll come back to this uh, uh, in a bit. But what I, when I want to move on to, now on, and just to the, the finally remind you, finally the first time that the Earth's motion was actually physically demonstrated, an experiment that could be shown that would show that the Earth really is uh, re, uh, revolving on its axis is the famous Foucault pendulum. Uh, and uh, Foucault finally got his uh, demonstration exhibit up in the Paris Observatory in 1851. <clears throat> You've all seen this, hopefully, in, in any large science museum has this. I just took the grandkids during spring break last week to Philadelphia's uh, wonderful science museum, the Franklin Institute, and they have a big, beautiful Foucault pendulum there, uh, revolving back and forth, changing its orientation as the day goes on. So we do want to look at 
at, our, at Galileo's analysis of motion. And um, certainly it's easy to uh, criticize Aristotle's theory of motion. Um, this idea he was criticized very early on that um, Aristotle's law of free fall says that the heavier an object is, the faster it will move down. And in a medium like air or water, this is generally true, okay? But Aristotle actually tried to put this into some kind of mathematical form, truly did in his, in his work, kind of a crude <laughs> attempt at, at, at putting this in some kind of a mathematical form. He said that the velocity, the speed, the velocity would be proportional to the weight. The greater the weight, the faster it would move down. It would also be inversely proportional to the resistance. The greater resistance, the slower it would move through that resistance. However, there would be no velocity at all if the weight was less than the resistance. If you, what you were pushing was less um, force than the amount of resistance that was pushing back, you would have no motion at all. For example, uh, pushing a, a heavy object. You can push very hard <laughs> and not be successful to budge at all because the resistance that uh, friction is giving you is greater than, than your ability to push. So these actually were Aristotle's laws. Again, this is all part of the physics of common sense, how Aristotle's ideas have been described. Uh, and they do describe in, 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 in certain ways uh, the way we experience um, motion you know, with, with, with resistance. Looking at a deduction that Aristotle makes from this, I know you're, if you're familiar with the famous phrase that nature abhors a vacuum. Well, nature abhors a vacuum comes from these two laws. Aristotle derives this idea that there can be no such thing as a vacuum. And we'll see this at the end of the talk when we come to Descartes, who agrees that there can be no such thing as a vacuum. Aristotle does it this way. Well, if you look at my two laws, imagine if there was no resistance at all. Look at that first law and make R zero. What happens when, R, when, when there's a zero in the denominator? If R is zero, then the velocity becomes infinite. At whatever weight, any fraction with a zero denominator basically is an infinite, is an infinite fraction. So without any resistance at all, according to my laws, you would have an infinite speed, which is impossible. And right? if you were moving at an infinite speed, you could be at two places at once at the same time. That's clearly logically impossible. So there can be no such thing as an infinite speed. Well, therefore, there can be no such thing as zero resistance. There always must be some kind of resistance uh, to uh, any kind of, uh, of motion. And since resistance comes from other objects, you know, uh, friction forces uh, against the moving object, Therefore, there never can be a perfect vacuum, because if there were a perfect vacuum, you would have no resistance, and therefore you would get infinite speed, which is an impossibility. So a very nice piece of logic in which we derive the idea that nature abhors a vacuum and that there always must be resistance. <clears throat> Galileo makes beautiful mincemeat of this with a, 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 an even more clever argument. Galileo's picture, of course, is on the right, that no matter what the weight is, things will drop at the same speed, as long as you ignore the resistance. If you can take away the resistance and just let things fall in a vacuum, they will all fall at the same speed, regardless of the weight. And of course, we all remember the great experiment done on the moon in 1969, when Armstrong dropped the feather and the hammer, and they fell to the ground at the same time. Uh, it's a wonderful video. It's easily found out on YouTube. Um, uh, you can Google that very easily and see Armstrong um, do that <clears throat> with the, uh, the, the feather and the hammer. Galileo, this experiment uh, dropping from the leaning tower of Pisa, it's not clear whether he actually ever did this or not. Most historians of science think he really didn't. Uh, this was a thought experiment that he knew what the answer would be um, if you could take away all the resistance. Um, and he makes a wonderful logical argument. He says, okay, so let's suppose that you're right. Suppose that you have a 10 pound ball and a one pound. And I drop the two together and the 10 pound ball will fall 10 times faster. Okay, assume that that's the case. 
Let's go ahead and hold on to that 10 pound ball and now go ahead and take another 10 pound ball and a one pound ball and tie them together with a very, very light string. Very light, short string together so that they're you know virtually almost touching and they really are together with the strong but very light string with, with no additional weight at all. The string is not going to add any additional weight. Let's drop the original 10 pound ball and now this new 11 pound ball. Let's drop them together. On the one hand, the 11 pound ball is heavier than the 10 pound ball, so therefore it will fall faster. And the combination of the two balls held by the very light string will hit the ground before the 10 pound ball. That would be one use of Aristotle's law. However, isn't it true that the 10 pound ball wants to move faster than the one pound ball and the one pound ball is creating a resistance it's giving the 10 pound ball an additional resistance because it doesn't want to move as fast as the 10 pound ball. So the 10 pound ball has to pull the one pound ball down with it so that it can keep up with the 10 pound ball. The one pound ball is creating a drag on the 10 pound ball. So wouldn't that configuration of the 10 pound ball and the one pound ball actually move slower than the 10 pound ball all by itself? Well, now, which one do you want to have? Do you want it to fall faster than the 10 pound ball? Or do you want it to fall slower than the 10 pound ball? I can make valid arguments using your laws uh, to come up with either, with either conclusion. Okay? A brilliant piece of logic uh, by, by Galileo. And he describes all this uh, in the uh, dialogue. So, let us turn now to the discourse uh, work that he writes under house arrest as a very old man becoming blind. He finally gets around to writing up uh, the experiments that he did so long ago at Padua, the motion experiments. <clears throat> the first two days are in really uh, are a different subject than motion. It's on the strength of materials, which he really breaks new ground on. But the last two days, the third and fourth day is, is on motion. And he begins the third day with this, uh, with, with, with this opening of paragraphs. So my purpose is to set forth a very new science dealing with a very ancient subject. There is in nature perhaps nothing older than motion, concerning which books written by philosophers are neither few nor small. Nevertheless, I have discovered by experiment some properties of which are worth knowing and which have not hitherto been either observed or demonstrated. Some superficial observations have been made as, for example, that the natural motion of a heavy falling body is continuously accelerated. But to just what extent this acceleration occurs has not yet been announced. For so far as I know, no one has pointed out that the distances traversed during equal intervals of time by a body falling from rest, stand to one another in the same ratio as the odd numbers beginning with unity. And we will see, <laughs> we will see this odd numbers rule uh, in a moment. It has been observed that missiles and projectiles describe a curved path of some sort. However, no one has pointed out the fact that this path is a parabola. But this and other facts, not few in number or less worth knowing, I have succeeded in proving and what I consider more important. There have been opened up to this vast and most excellent science of which my work is merely the beginning, ways and means by which other minds more acute than mine will explore its remote borders. And that's what I want to show you today, guys, is the ways and means that Galileo has shown he essentially invents modern physics on an inclined plane. This discussion is divided into three parts. The first part deals with motion, which is steady and uniform, which we will not talk about. The second treats motion uh, of accelerated in nature, which we all look at. And finally, the third part deals with the so-called violent motions of projectile. Projectiles, and we'll finish, we'll finish with, uh, with his demonstration of that. So let's get started. Galileo believes that the motion of free fall is, as he says, as simple as nature can have. What would be the simplest law that, that one could think of? Because nature is inherently simple, and it would pick the simplest way of something falling down. The simplest way is just that the speed would increase with time. 
if it fell a certain certain it would, it would have, have a certain speed after one second well it would have twice that speed after the second second and three times that speed after the third second etc it would just continually increasing speed in a very regular way as time went on isn't that the simplest possible uh, uh, way we can think of speed growing with time uh, in, in, in a free fall. That's how I think nature uh, actually behaves. But I have no way of, of measuring changing speed. No, in fact, we have no way of measuring changing speed. Okay? The way we measure changing speed is with a laser gun in which we can sample uh, distances 10 times a second, 20 times a second, and we can take very, very many, very, very short average speeds and, and, and aggregate those, okay? That's where they're going on the, with the gun, telling you how fast the pitch is, 100 miles an hour, or how fast you're going in a car uh, with, with, with the radar guns. You're not measuring speed, changing speed directly. You're measuring very, very short intervals of average speed. Galileo at this point has no way to measure any kind of changing speed, N not, not, even, not even a hope. He has no way of measuring even very fast speeds directly. All he can measure is average speeds over some kind of reasonable amount of time. So this first column here, these first two columns here is what he believes nature follows. That as time goes on, whatever speed you reach after the first second, It'll reach twice that after the second second and three times the second, but he has no way of measuring this column of numbers. However, what he can measure is distance. <clears throat> he can measure after the first second, how far have you traveled? And then in that second second, how much further have you traveled? He can measure distances like this. And he comes up with the odd numbers rule. He finds this experimentally. Now you may ask, is he looking for this? I mean, you imagine this is quite an elaborate experiment back in his day with the technology available to him to create uh, the apparatus so that he can go ahead and take these kinds of measurements. Okay. Um, why, is he, why is he doing this? Okay, we'll come to that in a minute. But here is the results. If the ball rolling down an inclined plane, by the way, he has the brilliant idea that if something is moving on an inclined plane, he's just simply watering down the motion of free fall. It's following exactly the same mathematical law, just at a different uh, uh, rate of increase of speed. Nothing has changed except the rate at which the speed is increasing, not the fact that it's increasing in that regular way. Every second it's going that much faster. <clears throat> it's just happening at a slower rate, something that he has the hope of measuring distance on. So the odd numbers rule is in the first second, if it moves one unit of distance, in the next second, it'll move three units of distance. So this is after time one, this is where the ball is after time two. And in the third second, it'll move five units of distance. So it'll have a total position of here. And the next second, it'll move seven units of distance. These are balls are taken one second apart. Again, one second, three seconds, whatever uh, interval that you want. <clears throat> Historians of science think that Galileo actually used singing to find his intervals. He was also an accomplished musician. His father was a well-known musician. And uh, uh, one thought is he actually would sing. He and his uh, assistants would sing a, a very simple melody with a real strong cadence. And they would see where the ball was at certain points when you would come to a certain part of the song. And literally that's how they took time measurements by, by singing this uh, very strong cadence song over and over again as they're rolling balls down the incline. Quite, you know, there, there, are, no, there, there are no accurate clocks. Uh, so the singing would be just as accurate as, as anything else. Like for example, a water clock, starting the water flowing and then turning the water off at different times. So this is the, the physical meaning of the, of the odd numbers rules. And these measurements he can take. He can find out how far the ball goes and whatever this distance is, call it B. In the next instant, it'll move a distance of 3B. So after all is said and done, it'll be 4B down, okay? Here's one, well, would you add three more? You're at four. And if it moves five units of distance after that, 
its total distance will be 9b down. And if you add these up, 1, 3, 5, you'll, you'll find yourself at 9. 9 plus 7, you'll find yourself at 16. And so we get this column of data. Okay. Clearly, one can see that the law is b times t squared. Okay. 4, 9, 16, 25. It's that initial distance times the time squared. He has found an empirical law for this motion, this very slow motion going down an inclined plane. By the way, this incline is very, very small. The historians of science believe from his notes that he used a slope of about two degrees. Very, very gentle inclined plane because he needs these balls to move very slowly if he has any hope of taking measurements with the technology which is available to him. Here's the law of free fall. This is how the speed is changing, but he has no way of measuring these column of numbers. He has no way of measuring A, that constant proportionality of how much you would add to the speed at each time. A is completely unmeasurable to him because all these numbers are unmeasurable to him, but these numbers he can measure. And B is simply the very first distance that traveled in the first unit of time. This is the set of data he can measure. Question is, why does he go through this? Why it, is this just, is he just taking all kinds of experiments and he happens to find this data among the morass of things that he's done? Very much the way Kepler took the tremendous data of, of, of Tycho and tried to find some kind of regularities? No, that would be hopeless. There's too much, too much possible things that you could do. You have to have a direction. You have to have some kind of an underlying idea of why you would choose one kind of an experiment as opposed to something else. Because it takes time to set up a controlled experiment. It takes thought, it takes technology, it takes all kinds of preparation. You have to do this again and again and again and analyze the data that you get. It's a very, very elaborate process. Okay. something which was completely unknown in the ancient paradigm, the idea of taking experimental measurements like this. There's no way they would ever possibly do this. This is something new, this kind of detailed uh, preparation for controlled experiments like this. Why is he doing this? Because he has a theoretical idea that he wants to demonstrate. And it goes like this. <clears throat> Let's take constant speed. Constant speed is pretty simple. Okay? We know how far things go if the speed here, V for velocity, if the speed is constant. If we go to a certain amount of time, we know from the third grade formula that distance is equal to speed times time. Okay, we all agree upon that. That's a definition pretty much of speed. <laughs> Notice that the, that the, that the speed is, uh, the distance is the speed times the time, it's the speed times the time, it's nothing more than the area of this rectangle. It's nothing more than the height times the width of the rectangle. That's what the distance is. The distance is the area under the speed graph. Okay, a nice observation. Now let's go to the more difficult and more interesting part of this increasing speed. This is the way speed would increase according to Galileo's assumption that, the, that nature is as simple as possible and it would simply grow very simply in proportion to the time. It would be this straight line kind of, of increase. Now you ask the question, how far would things go like this? Now we don't have an, uh, an easy obvious answer in terms of any kind of formula, okay? All we have again, is this notion of the area under the speed curve. And the assumption that was made in the late Middle Ages, by the way, that this law would hold, that again, under this kind of a scenario, the distance that you would travel in the increasing speed would again be the area under the speed time graph. And if that were the case, then actually, what would this area be? Well, the area, according to the, the, uh, the, the medieval scholars, is if you were to take that middle speed, the average speed, what they call the mean speed, the speed in the middle of the, of the increase, and see how far something would travel if it just stayed at that speed. 
if that was the speed for the entire trip, how far would it go? Well, it would go, as we know, this rectangle. It would go the speed, the, the mean speed times the time. So this would be the distance that it would travel if it, if it followed you know, one constant speed, that middle speed. But aren't these two distances the same, okay? <clears throat> this area under the graph is this common piece plus this triangle and the area that we're interested in <clears throat> is that same common piece plus this triangle, right? But these two triangles are congruent. You can see that they're congruent. Few, few, few people who remember your geometry, this would be angle side angle is equal to angle side angle and we would have two congruent triangles. So these areas are in fact the same. So we can say that yes, the area under this increasing speed would be the same as if you went at the constant speed of the median of those, of those increasing speeds, the middle speed, the half speed of V over two. And this is called the mean speed rule that was discovered, like I say, back in the 13, 1400s. <clears throat> it was never experimentally uh, verified in any way um, because they didn't do experiments back in the 13, 1400s. This was a, a theoretical idea. And the idea was way beyond speeds. They did this for any kind of change in quality. They were interested in qualities of wetness and softness, even qualities of happiness and grace. If things were of, of a constant quality or of an increase in quality. They did this kind of analysis. It's not clear whether even Galilei was aware of this, this analysis. Uh, some historians believe he really had to rediscover this uh, all on his own. With these very modern kinds of graphs that were used by the, uh, uh, by the scholars of, of the late Middle Ages. So what do we have here? Galileo is assuming that he knows what the velocity is at any time. It's that AT, though he cannot measure that. Whatever the acceleration, whatever that rate of growth is, the velocity at any time is AT. On the other hand, what, what the, the, the mean speed law says is that the distance that you travel is the average speed times the time, which is half the velocity times the time. That would be the distance that you travel, but isn't the velocity AT? If my theoretical analysis is correct, if my assumption is correct, that the velocity is growing according to the rule AT, which I cannot verify experimentally, then the distance would be not only VT over two, which is this analysis, it would be one half AT squared. It would be one half that A number, which I can't measure directly times the time squared. Here's my theoretical analysis coming up with the same fundamental law that the distance is proportional to the time squared, just like we found on the incline plane. And that's why Galileo was going through all the trouble of setting up the incline plane and doing this experiment over and over again. He wants to verify this theoretical analysis. He can't measure one half A. But what he can measure is, does, does distance change, change with time squared? <clears throat> and so the, the law would be the distance is equal to one half the acceleration times the time squared. That is the law of constant acceleration. If you ever knew what the acceleration was of free fall, it's given the letter G for gravity. If we ever knew what that value G was, which we have no way of measuring directly at all, it's, it's an acceleration of, never mind, can we measure velocity? We can't measure, uh, never mind trying to measure acceleration directly. We can't measure velocity, changing velocities directly. But that would, that would be the law, it would be one half GT squared, which would be the distance, how things fall in free fall, if we knew what that acceleration was. We now know, of course, that that acceleration is 32 feet per second faster every second. Yeah, it's an acceleration. It's how the velocity grows. The acceleration is 300 feet per second every second. Okay. So this is why he's doing this experiment. This is his theoretical assumption. This is what he says the law of nature follows. If nature follows this law, it will also follow this law. 
And this is a law I can verify in experiment, as difficult as it may be. With all the problems of experimentation, okay? All the problems of taking real data, seeing how closely the measured data comes up with the theoretical data that you're looking for. And if, you, and if anyone's remembered your old science labs, <laughs> you remember trying to write those science reports, trying to make the teacher happy that the data that you did take <laughs> was not very close to the data that was supposed to be taken. <clears throat> All the problems involved with experimentation uh, are here, okay? And this is why he wants, because on the one hand, he has a rule, an empirical rule that he can measure in experiment that the distance is proportional to the time squared. On the other hand, he has a derived rule coming from a more fundamental rule of that the speed increases simply linearly with time according to this number A, all the acceleration. And he's able to show that yes, the derived rule is true because it in fact is a measured rule. Not only is he able to then prove, and I put that in quotes, prove that this rule is true, he can prove that the speed is equal to at because the distance is equal to bt squared. Not only can he prove that, but he can also then find a way to compute a, that number which is completely unmeasurable. From a column of numbers that he has no way of knowing what these numbers are, and therefore can no way empirically discover this number A by, by finding this number B, looking at his two derived rules, he can say clearly that B is the same thing as a half of A. And therefore A is nothing more than twice B. And he has a measure of A, a number that he cannot measure directly. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the birth of modern science. This is how science is done. It's even given a fancy name, it's called, it's called the uh, empirical deductive method, in which you use empirical methods, measurements that you can take to prove things that you can't measure. Okay? This is why experiments are done like this. They're designed from theory. Let's take the largest machine ever built, right? The Hadron Collider. Uh, over in CERN. It is the largest machine ever built, uh, uh, you know, in history. How is that machine built? Why is it built that way? Why is it designed that way? It's designed from theory, just as this experiment here of Galileo is designed from this column of numbers that he's after. From this column, he can derive this number and he design, designs an experiment to get these numbers. That's how the Hadron Collider is designed with all those hundreds of millions, I think, or thousands of miles of wire, okay, and circuits. Why is that put together that way? Because of the, you know, quantum theory and the particle uh, model uh, 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 of physics. From that theory, the scientists know what they are looking for. And so they build a machine to look for those things. Once you have such machine, of course, you always have the chance of finding things that are unexpected. Yes, that's part of the scientific method, okay? That as you delve using your machines, using your experiment, you may find surprises which need explanation. But how do you design the original experiment from what you're looking for? It's not just some kind of willy-nilly thing of looking around at any kind of possible, you know, Phenomena that, 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 that you may come across. Of course, there's just simply too many phenomena to come across. So the idea of the, of the experimental method hooked up with a mathematical analysis, and so the flow comes. And that's it. This is, this is one, of the, one of the great intellectual feats of, 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 of history. Okay? It's often been said Galileo invented physics, modern physics on an inclined plane. This is why, okay? And <clears throat> so again, from, from these results, you can actually measure, compute that number, which is theoretically, I mean, practically un unmeasurable, that acceleration A. And one could ask, 
Okay, now that we have this law for the inclined plane, and we have this, again, this notion that the inclined plane is nothing more than a watered down version of the true free fall. Can we find from this acceleration, this A number that we know at this slope, a slope of two degrees, can we find what the acceleration would be at 90 degrees when we truly have full free fall? Can the mathematics help us with that? Now that we have verified the law and we know what the numbers are for one angle. Can we find out for any angle? And in particular, can we find it out for a straight drop, which would be nothing more than an angle of 90 degrees? And Galileo goes ahead and does that. This is the other side of the experimental method. Not only do we use experiments to find, to verify things that we're looking for, now we're going to use that law to find things, new information, information that is beyond the experimental method things that we couldn't find directly by experiment. Galileo says, suppose you take a ball and you drop it at a certain time and it falls a certain distance D. This is the free fall distance, okay, at a certain time. And if I took another ball simultaneously and rolled it down an inclined plane at some angle, okay, some angle that I know, it'll, at, at the time that the free fall stops here, the other ball would stop here. Is there a relationship between these two places? Is there a relationship between where, how the free fall reaches at a certain time, say 10 seconds, and where the inclined plane ball would be after 10 seconds? Because if there is, if I can find a mathematical relationship between these two places, then I can find a mathematical relationship between the acceleration that this ball is going down, which I know I can measure that, if this, if this slope is slow enough, I can measure that acceleration. I'll, I'll get a relationship between this acceleration and this acceleration. And in fact, the relationship is a very beautiful one. If you let D, that distance of free fall, define the diameter of a circle, then if you let the ball drop down the inclined plane, it will reach out to the boundary of the circle. It'll be a chord on that circle, okay? And the proof is very nice. I won't go through the proof for you math types. The proof is right here using a little bit of trig. <clears throat> the point is that, that given that you can prove this relationship, if you now know what the acceleration is here from this angle, you can compute the angle here. I'm sorry, you can compute the acceleration here and we can actually derive the 32 feet per second faster every second. So this is the other side of what Galileo was doing. On the one hand, he takes this empirical law, which he designed an experiment for, so that he can verify his general law of AT, of, I'm sorry, of V is equal to AT. And now that he has that, he can go ahead and go back to his data and analyze the various different experimental constructions of this to find out his law for complete free fall. And just a visual picture of that law. Very pretty. If I would take a, these different balls and roll them down simultaneously, they are all always on this circle. They're pretty, yeah. And because of this mathematical relationship between the positions of the balls at different angles, different slopes, I can then calculate what the different accelerations are if I know any one of them. If I can calculate this acceleration through my experimental method, I can calculate all these other accelerations because of this mathematical relationship that you see in front of your eyes. And we won't, I won't bother to, you know, to go through that. Just trust me on that, that that would make sense, that the math would dictate what all these accelerations would be once we have this kind of, uh, of relationship. Okay, so that is the story of the inclined plane and why the inclined plane is so famous uh, when we talk about Galileo. Let me stop here, questions, comments of what we've done so far. I wanna emphasize what we're doing is quite a bit of math in this class, probably more math we're doing here than in any class that we that we'll have. Um, and if you're not 
comfortable with the details of the math, then don't worry about that. That's not important. There are two things which are important. One is to, is to get the idea that the math is trying to explain, trying to describe, trying to express physical ideas. That the mathematical equations, the mathematical ideas are somehow or other trying to describe the physical ideas. Perfect example is we think that speed will increase in a very simple way, in a very proportional way. If you let something drop, it'll reach a certain speed at a certain amount of time. If you let it drop twice as long, it'll hit twice that speed. That's the idea. The math is V is equal to AT. That's the expression of that idea. It's the idea that I want you to, 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 to get and try to grapple with, not so much the importance of V is equal to AT. Then there's the manipulation of the math. Okay, that's very mechanical. That's you have to be familiar with the math bill to do that. Very important, otherwise we can make new progress, but it's not important for our purposes. We, you can trust me on that component. Then the last component is the conclusions that we can draw from the mathematics. The mathematics can teach us things. First of all, it can confirm things that we suspect like these fundamental laws, and it can prove new things from further analysis that we can draw from the mathematics, new ideas and new results that were unknown to us beforehand. That's the power of the mathematics. That's what I would like to try to, to get. Not so much to worry about the equations and the therefores and the moving things on both sides of the equations and dividing it. That's, those are all mechanics which you, could, which you can trust me on. Okay, so let me not close this. Okay. <clears throat> so let us now go to the other side. Now that we have these laws, Galileo has two laws. He has the law of inertia, which tells me if something is moving in a straight line at a constant speed, if there are no unbalanced forces on it, it'll continue to do that forever. On the other hand, if you drop something down, free fall, let it drop, it'll accelerate according to the law, one half gt squared, where g is this acceleration due to gravity. He has two different laws. And what he realizes is that if you were to throw something as a projectile, what you're looking at is two motions simultaneously. That's what I showed you um, with, the, uh, with the ship. And here's just a picture from his notebook of his analysis. And here's the idea that as you throw the ball out, let's say from a cliff going straight out, not only will it continue, not only will this ball drop the way it drops in free fall, but it'll continue to move in a straight line in this direction. And so the composite motion is a combination of the two. Okay. Here's another example. <clears throat> the ball continues to move out. If you look at these dash lines, the ball continues to move out at the speed it hit at this bottom, and it continues to drop according to the law of free fall. And Galileo was now going to analyze this mathematically and prove that this arc is in fact a parabola. So let's go ahead and do that. Truly one of the high points of our course. This motion is very well known. It's used all the time. It's a fascinating motion to watch. This parabolic motion has been studied forever, trying to get a handle on this and being used. We see it all over. And this would be the ultimate motion if you actually started from the ground and go up, down, you would get this parabolic motion. This is a little bit beyond us. Uh, we're gonna do something a bit simpler. We're just gonna roll the ball off of a cliff, okay? And let it just drop down. <clears throat> Let's go through Galileo's analysis of this. We're going to prove that this dotted line is a parabola, okay? This is the first time in history that this is done, okay? <clears throat> that you take a natural motion, a motion in the real world, Take the laws of motion that you have discovered, 
that or that you know. It turns out he discovered them, but laws that you know, fundamental laws, and from the fundamental laws to come up with the trajectory of a natural motion. Never done before. First time done by Galileo. And again, let me just show you that animation that do, I do think is, is useful. The idea is we have this ball moving along with the mass of the ship, and we have a ball on a bridge stationary. And just as the mass reaches the bridge, we drop the two balls. We drop the ball from the bridge, which is states the ball has been stationary, and we drop the ball from the mass. How will the resultant ball dropped from the mass <clears throat> be related to the ball that we dropped straight down and the ball that was moving along? up on top of the, in the crow's nest before it was dropped. Okay? And this animation is trying to demonstrate what Galileo was saying, <clears throat> that the motion of the ball dropped from the mass will have two motions simultaneously. Not only will it keep up with the ball that was not dropped, it'll continue to have the constant speed of the ship because of the law of inertia. It will also drop down exactly according to the law of free fall. And the trajectory will be a combination of both. Okay. Again, Galileo discovered this. <laughs> this is the first time someone makes this kind of analysis that, that the motion can be a composite of two independent motions put together. Another one of his important uh, discoveries. Okay. What we want to now show is that this is a parabola. Okay. Here we go. All right. <clears throat> we let the ball roll off the table. And it's now in, in the air. At a certain amount of time t, it's here, okay, along this trajectory. Can we find a way of mathematically describing where that ball is at the time t? That's what Galileo wants to do. Well, it's at a certain distance out from the table, and it's at a certain distance height above the ground, okay? Can we find X and Y if we know T? Okay. Can we find out how far it's gone out? And can we find out how high it is at any time T? And if we can, could we therefore calculate what the range of the ball would be, where it would hit the ground? Can we calculate that? Something that we could calculate theoretically, not have to do many, many, uh, measurements of and, and learned by experience. Can this theoretical analysis give us new knowledge that we would never find before? Can the math do this for us? Well, let's see. Stay with me here. This is not, this is not all that difficult. You, you non-math types, stay with me here. You'll, you'll, you'll see this, is, this, this works, I think. Okay. We know that the ball is undergoing the law of free fall. So at this time t, it has fallen this amount. I call it little z, it's one half gt squared. This is Galileo's law of free fall. It has fallen this amount at that time t. So where is the ball? Well, the ball is at the height h minus little z. It's the original height that it started with minus the amount that it's fallen. But I know z is one half gt squared. So the height above the, the ground is at any time h, the original height, minus the amount that it's full. I now know what y is in terms of t. x is even easier. Oh, so, so y is equal to h minus z. x is even easier because of the law of inertia. The distance is simply vt. v doesn't change. There's no force in this direction. There's nothing to slow the ball down in this direction. It'll just continue to move at the speed of V as it's falling through the air. So X is very easy. X is nothing more than VT. So I now know what X is in terms of T. I know what Y is in terms of T, and I know what X is in terms of T. Here's Y in terms of T, here's X in terms of T. Now we do a little bit of math. Now you can glaze over your eyes for a couple of seconds. <laughs> and trust me, you math types stay with me. 
you trust me that we're going to go ahead and derive something new from the mathematics. The mathematics will give us new knowledge. Okay? We go ahead and solve the x equation for t. t is equal to x over v. If x is equal to vt, then t is equal to x over v, and put that t into the y equation. And so I can solve that y in terms of x has the form y is equal to h minus this set of variables times x squared. It's just algebra. Trust me that this is true. What's important is that this thing here, g over t v squared, is a constant number. g is the, is the rate of free fall. According to Galileo, that's a constant number. v is a constant number because of the law of inertia. So g over 2v squared is a constant number. This has the equation h minus ax squared, where h and a are constants. This is the form of a parabola, and we are done. Okay. This is the first time in history anyone has been able to do this. This is a monument. Okay. Of course, we're using modern algebra. Galileo never wrote an equation in his life. He made a geometric argument exactly equivalent to this, we're using you know, the language that we are much more familiar with. Okay? So this is it. Here's the analysis that here is the relationship between y and x as it falls through the air. And that relationship is a it's very simple upside down parabola. Can we go further? Can we find that range of just how far the ball falls out from the table? Well, what is the range? It's when the ball hits the ground. When does the ball hit the ground? This is now, we come to a point where we come to a dividing line in a sense, guys, between people who are comfortable with mathematics, who are experienced with it, who it makes sense, to people who will always struggle with this. They'll see it when it's shown to them, but it's not natural to them. And with the group I'm talking to here, some of you will find this answer very, very natural and obvious. And of course, and other people will say, yeah, yeah, okay, now that I see it, but I would not have think, that would not occur to me <laughs> the first or the second time. This is, I see what, 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 what the math can do, but it's not natural to me. And the, one reason could be because you just haven't done it. You haven't pursued a career in which you have to do this kind of mathematical analysis, okay? These are the kind of things you're supposed to learn in school and at least have some familiarity with it. But school has been a long time away. So when does the ball hit the ground? The ball hits the ground when y is zero. Yeah, I've taken a question, a very simple, you know, everyday question, when does the ball hit the ground? And I've turned it into a mathematical answer. It's when one of the quantities that we're talking about has a certain value. This is that bridge that some people find very difficult to do. They just don't, okay. But given the fact that, yeah, you will hit the ground when y is equal to zero, but I know when y hits the zero, okay? Just find out when y is zero. Okay? Take my y equation and set it equal to zero. Let the math do the work. Find out what is the t that makes y zero. This is the t the square root of 2h over g. At that t, y will be zero. That's the flight time. That's the time it takes for it to reach the ground. New knowledge. What's the range? Well, the range is simply how far it went in that t. Okay, give me any t, I'll tell you how far out it went. It went v times that t. So what's the range? It's v times the flight time. And this is the other side of, of modern science. Here we are making deductions from our mathematical knowledge. These are things that we could never know, except you could do them experimentally, do it a thousand times and get some kind of general. But if you wanted to set up a range table, okay, for, for a ballistic missile, to say, what is the force going? What velocity? What angle? May, how far will go? Where will it? If you want to create those theoretically, you need this kind of mathematical analysis. And in fact, this was the very first use 
of the of the of the earliest computers. The earliest computers, those big room sized things with all the di all the vacuum tubes, they were they were done to uh, calculate ballistic uh, tables of how far a rocket would go or a cannonball would go or any kind of projectile would go given the angle, given the initial velocity being sent out by the, by the initial power of the force, what would be the tra 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 trajectory uh, of the projectile, okay? Of course, they would add to this theoretical analysis, the air resistance, the equations become much more complicated. That's why you need the computer, but this was actually the first problem that the computer solved was the air resistance version of what Galileo is doing here, just with simple no, no, no air resistance at all. And just one more thing before we, we leave Galileo. Again, there's a mathematical relationship uh, between these different projectiles. And uh, let me show you. If I were to shoot out a whole set of projectiles at the same time. We get a very nice pattern, right? We know this from our fountains and our fireworks displays, get these very nice patterns that we see we're very familiar with, very pretty, <laughs> okay? Is there, is there, is there, are there mathematical relationships here that we can use to, 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 to gain new knowledge? And let me show you some of the relationships, not even all. Same picture. I've just traced out for you the trajectories, exactly the same picture. Okay. <clears throat> all those little parabolas here, the blue one, the orange one, the green one, these are simply the trajectories of all those cannonballs shot out <clears throat> at the same speed at different angles. Okay. The first thing that you'll notice is that the balls reach a certain envelope. Okay? They don't go beyond, they don't go beyond this dotted line envelope here. This envelope is itself a parabola. It's called the parabola of surety. If you're outside of that, you're sure not to get hit by the ball. That's why it's called that. Okay? So this is the parabola of surety, the envelope that the that the trajectiles make. And take a look at the apexes, the vertexes of all the various um, um, different balls. Okay. Take a look at, here's the top of this parabola. Here's the top of this parabola. Here's the top of this parabola. Over here, the top. Here's the top. And if you were to connect all those tops of all the individual directories, you would get this curve. This curve, not surprisingly, is an ellipse. And this shouldn't surprise us because we know the parabola and the ellipse are part of the same family of curves called conic sections. And this very beautiful geometry is not clearly a coincidence, but these are all mathematical consequences of this fundamental parabolic law. Okay? And you can use these relationships to derive other relationships and, and new knowledge uh, about these kinds of motions. You can see we're in a world just in a different, it's in a different space. It's, a, it's in a different mental space, a different space of ability and the ability to ask questions than the old paradigm. We have truly moved into the modern world here with these ideas. These are the ideas that Galileo brings to us. This is why the, the quote from Einstein that Galileo is the, uh, the father of of modern physics, indeed of science itself. This is why he says this. Okay, so that is our story of, um, of Galileo. Any questions before we uh, move on to our second presentation? I hope, I hope I have not, <laughs> I hope I've not totally zoned you guys out that you're with me. Um, again, your math types, I think the math is simple enough to follow. If you didn't follow it in real time, if you look at my slides, if you bring them in, 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 you know, in mode, you know, that slide slide mode, you'll be able to see 
the idea is <clears throat> for, you, for the guys not all that comfortable with the math, again, it's the ideas that I would like you to focus on, okay? Not the, not the technical mathematics, the ideas behind what we're trying to say. And I hope that that, that is clear. So what happened between Galileo and Newton? Well, uh, uh, quite a bit. Okay? Here's a wonderful picture of the, uh, here there's, there's, there's the new, the, the, the new Almagest, uh, someone who wrote this uh, in 1651. Here we're measuring Tycho's system against uh, Copernicus's system. I'm sorry, Copernic Tycho's system here as opposed to Copernicus system. And you see Tycho's system is winning on the scale. Here's poor Ptolemy's system down here discarded in the front pace of this work supporting the Tycho system, which became very popular because it keeps the earth stationary. Talk about measurements and new technologies. I just wanna show you some of the important examples of what the telescope brought to the, uh, the rest of the 17th century um, and how it pushed this new paradigm with these measurements. Here's an old picture from our first course in the, in the fall of Aristarchus, finding the relationship between the distance between the distance to the moon and the sun. Here's the earth here. There's the moon going around the earth and there's the sun way out here. Aristarchus asked the question, when do we get exactly the quarter moon or poetically the half moon? When, the, when is the moon exactly half lit? <clears throat> he said, it will be half lit when, these, when the rays of the sun are just tangent to, uh, to the orbit of the moon. Then the sun will be exactly half lit to us. Now, of course, the sun is very, very far away. This is a more accurate picture where the light from the sun is virtually coming in parallel. Okay? But if we could measure this thing, which is virtually 90 degrees, these two lines are virtually parallel. So not only is this 90 degrees, but this is also 90 degrees. But if with a telescope, if it would be possible to measure this angle, which is 89 point something degrees, if you could make that distinction, if you could measure this angle here, from the earth, the elongation basically between the moon and the sun at the quarter moon. If you could measure the elongation with this right angle, look at what we get for the relationship between the distance out to the moon and the distance out to the sun. The cosine of that angle becomes the adjacent over the hypotenuse. Yeah, if we could measure this angle, then the cosine of that angle is the distance of the moon divided by the distance of the sun. Okay. And I could solve for the distance of the sun. Again, trust me, if you're not happy with the, with the algebra, the distance of the sun is computable from the angle and the distance of the moon. But Ptolemy told us what the distance of the moon was. It's 60 Earth radii. We knew that back in 100 AD. And the size of the Earth, Aristosthenes, Aristosthenes told us that the Earth was about 4,000 miles in radius. That was done in 250 BC. <clears throat> if we could know this number, we know this number in, 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 in miles, we could go ahead and do this computation. Wendelin goes ahead and uses the new technology of the computer and goes from Aristarchus's number of 87, woefully too small, to a much better number of 89 degrees, 45 minutes. Only the telescope can do this for us. This is in 1647. This is 30 years of telescope development from Galileo, 30 years of better telescopes. And he gets a measurement of 89 uh, degrees, 45 minutes. And this is simply just doing the math, sticking in that into the cosine and getting a number, okay? It turns out to be 229 times the distance to the moon Given the fact that we know uh, how much uh, that is, we can calculate the distance out to the sun. He gets a distance of 48 million. This number of 4.8 million was used by Aristarchus and kept through Galileo's time. We were not able to improve that number. There's just no way, there's no technology to improve that number until Wendelin goes, goes, goes ahead and revises Aristarchus's method with a better measurement. That was the only thing wrong with Aristarchus's. It wasn't the math, it was the measurement. That's what the new technology can do. Okay. 
So, Gwen, so Gwendolyn increases the size of the solar system by 10. He pushes the sun out 10 times further than it had been held for 2000 years. Okay. Talk about changing the paradigm, talking about being overwhelmed with, really, that it's that far away? The sun is that far? And therefore, Saturn is that? Okay. It's, and we're not done. By the way, he was also credited with, uh, with demonstrating with a telescope that Kepler's uh, third law was, was uh, obeyed by the moons of Jupiter, a very important uh, confirmation of Kepler's third laws. Just remind you, the modern number is not 229, it's 390 moon uh, uh, distances to the moon. It's of course 93 million miles, a well-known number. Okay, we come to Cassini, an even better number for the distance out to the sun. Here's his resume uh, and the very famous Cassini mission, uh, the great flybys be by Jupiter and Saturn, uh, coming back with very important early data in the early 2000s. Remember that Copernicus showed us how to compute the distances, the orbits of the uh, planets relative to the orbit of the Earth. We call the orbit of the Earth one. He was able to, to, to find the relative sizes of the orbits. And here's the picture that we did with Mars way back then, where, <clears throat> where he was able to compute that the orbit of Mars was 50% bigger than the orbit uh, of the Earth. Mars is very close to us. And when Mars is in opposition, remember opposition, sun on one side, Mars on the other, this is just a half. If this is one, then this distance here is just a half, okay? Very, very close. Well, with Kepler's laws, we now have much, much more accuracy, okay? And now with all these different oppositions, again, here's, this, here's the Earth, here's Mars, we can go ahead and look at all kinds of, calculate all kinds of opposite oppositions. Again, sun on one side, Mars on the other, and find these different oppositions from Kepler's tables and notice that here on a certain date, we get a very, very close one, okay? Not the average of about a half, but the average of about a third, okay? So Cassini knows that in, in 1672, we're gonna get a very, very close opposition, that Mars is gonna be only 38% of our distance to the sun. Here's an opportunity to take a good parallax measurement of Mars, okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll stop here with this final piece of mathematics. <clears throat> so hang with me here for the, for the next five minutes. This is uh, how you actually do a parallax measurement. We're trying to measure this angle here, P. What he does is he mounts the first international expedition in 1672. <clears throat> He's the director of the Paris Observatory. And he takes a team and he sends it out to French Guiana, down in the town of Sayini, which as he knows is 4,000 miles away. And so he has a baseline. He takes some measurements of Mars and, this, and the stars behind it <clears throat> at that opposition. And he has his team in Sayini take the same measurements on the same day and finding out what stars it's Mars, it's behind in that same day. And they take the boat back, comes back months later, and they report back what star A is. He has star B that he saw on that night, and now he finally finds out what his team in Sainini found on that same night. He has these two stars. Okay, that's his data. He also knows this distance here of 5,000. That's his data. If he could only measure this angle P, the parallax angle, Look what he has. He has basically an isosceles triangle, which he knows the vertex angle and the base. Clearly, the geometers can come to his aid and calculate the height or the length of any of the, uh, of the sides. Take your pick, they're all about the same. He could go ahead and measure the distance from the Earth to Mars, okay? By knowing that those parameters of the isosceles triangle, the vertex angle and the base, Using trigonometry, trust me, you can calculate this length or the height or fundamentally the distance from, from, from Paris to Mars. Okay. <clears throat> That's the game. But how do you measure an angle way out here? This angle is out at Mars. It's out in the middle of space. How do you measure this angle? How is this done? 
remember this is not to scale, okay? This, these distances out here are like, if this is one, <laughs> this is like a million. That's how far away the stars are, okay? So this is very, very, very far away. Please keep that in mind as we look at, at what uh, Giovanni Cassini is up to. One more reminder, parallel lines. If you have two parallel lines and I cut it with a straight line called the transversal, if I mark these two angles, A and B, they're called alternate interior angles and they're equal. The transversal creates two angles, two angles here. They're alternate interior. They're alternate on either side and they're both interior. We'll need this fact that alternate interior angles are equal. There's also corresponding angles. They're also equal, okay? And then there's also the vertical angles. They're always equal. They have nothing to do with parallel lines. You make a cross. You always know. This is the one that we'll, we'll need to know, that alternate interior angles of two parallel lines cut by a straight line are equal. They're right out of Euclid. Okay, now that we know what we need to know, <clears throat> we're back in Paris and he has these two positions. He goes ahead from his observatory now months later, once his team comes back and he goes ahead and he cites that same star that they saw in Syene. He has his measurement back of the line of sight from Mars back months before where Mars was behind star B. He knows star B. Now that he knows star A, he takes a measurement of star A at the same opposition time, okay? He knows, of course, where the stars are three months before. He has all the planetarium software. He has Kepler's tables. He knows where all the stars are at any time. He doesn't have to wait around for the next time. Uh -uh. Guys, what you have to realize is that this point is so far away that these two lines are parallel. They're virtually parallel. The lines coming in are virtually parallel. The line that the team, his team found from Syene, and now the new line that he has is parallel. And since these two lines are parallel, his original line of sight is a transversal crossing two parallel lines. His line of sight to his original star is a transversal of two parallel lines, a line of sight from Syene and now his new line of sight to that same star from Paris. This line here is a transversal. By the way, I've marked the Paris as P, Syene as C and Mars as M, just so that we can talk about triangles. So A, A uh, P, yeah. Yeah, AP, I really should have said AM, I guess. A, A, M, oh, I'm sorry, let me say, this line here, P, M, I said AP, I shouldn't have said that. This red line here is a transversal of, uh, of, of, of AC. I'm sorry, transversal of, confuse myself. This red line is a transversal of AP and AC. I did mark it correctly. These two lines of sight. Therefore, that angle there is the same as angle P. This and these two angles are alternate interiors. And now I don't need to know angle P way out at Mars. I have my very two angles that I measure from Paris. It's virtually the same angle. He measured that angle to be 25 seconds of arc, a very small angle. I remember one second of arc is 1 60th of a minute of arc and 60 minutes of an arc just makes up one degree. Again, we need the technology of the telescope. We're now at 1672, we're 60 years of development of better and better telescopes to take this measurement of 25 uh, arc. And now he has his measurements, he knows P, he knows D. Trust me, you can go ahead and measure the distance of the, you know, the length of the, uh, of the triangle, the height, 
decides whatever you get. They're all virtually the same. He gets a number of 33 million miles, okay? A big number for the distance out to Mars. Ah, but that's 38% of the distance out to the sun. Kepler tells him that that is 0.38 AU. If 33,000 miles is 0.38 AU, then one AU must be, do a little math, 86 million miles. He finds in 1672, the distance out to the sun is 93% of the actual distance of the 93 million miles. You see how we're getting into, you know, these numbers are awe inspiring. Okay? These numbers are, it's like when we're told, you know, that the black, a black hole is, uh, you know, 100 million suns and that uh, the age of the universe is 13.8 billion years and that there are 100 billion stars in our galaxy and there are 100 billion. This is what these numbers are doing back then. They are just creating a new paradigm with these numbers. Okay, we'll stop here. I have one more piece of math to show you uh, next time. Uh, and then we'll go through the really the breaking up of the paradigm with the ideas mostly of, um, you know, put forth by um, Descartes. Any questions before we go? You guys have been awful quiet. I hope I've not just completely zonked you. I hope that uh, you've been able to follow what I've been doing. I okay. love the way you stretch my brain. <laughs> okay, I know. It's been it's wonderful not... uh, realizing how important that geometry class was that I took back in. Uh, you know, <laughs> back, yeah, back, back 50, 60, yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. I appreciate it, I appreciate it. Okay, guys, we're gonna try to finish this up quickly because I think these ideas are worthwhile. Newton's math is too complicated for us. I'm gonna give you one example of Newton's math and just list the other stuff that he's done. And we can all just, gape with our mouth as the ability of what Newton can do with Galileo's method. And then we'll go ahead and turn our attention to this new paradigm, our paradigm of the quantum theory, what we've learned in our course and see if we can have an interesting discussion. So I look forward to next week's last class. All right, guys, have a good week. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Okay.